today we are talking something about very relevant topic which is very relevant to nowadays so what is happening is there are plenty of these what is called as lifestyle acquired diseases so which is causing multiple problems as well and it includes problems like hypertension diabetes and uh, these kind of problems so which is more related to our lifestyle so gone are those days when it was said you know uh, these problems are more common only in those rich people in fact so nowadays it is even common in those any of those people middle income people high income people or of course even lower income people as i said it it is more related to the lifestyle and this is the reason why it is called as a silent killer because most of the times it's not like the communicable disease in which you see a acute mortality what happens the death the morbidity and the mortality tends to happen over time due to which there is problems in the heart the brain the kidney the eyes and the other organs as well so this is what is called as the cardiovascular continuum continuum why because what is happening is one risk factor leads to the another one so for example if someone is having a problem like diabetes hypertension this leads to atherosclerosis or the left ventricular hypertrophy which further leads to coronary artery disease leading to myocardial ischemia leading to thrombosis myocardial infarction arrhythmias which further leads to remodeling and finally the congestive heart failure tends to happen and finally the end stage heart disease so this is why this is called as a continuum so for example one event leads to the other one in fact so in fact what happens is when you will try to see for these risk factors hypertension is one of the most common risk factors which leads to maximum morbidity and also mortality so even when uh, over here as well when you try to see so some of those leading causes for the uh, you know mortality are attributed with diabetes tobacco abuse and of course also with the hypertension so even when you talk about the south asia as well or india in fact india is home to one of the maximum number of hypertensive in fact and one third of the people they have hypertension and that is the reason so for example this hypertension is also correlated with other risk factors other risk factors what are we talking about is the comorbidities comorbidities include the obesity the reduced good cholesterol and of course glucose intolerance the hyperinsulinemia or even the high ldl cholesterol as well so in fact half of our common population has more than two or more morbidities in fact so if we are thinking of the management we should be able to know how to measure it how to classify the investigations the risk assessment the treatment and of course what are the concomitant therapies which you should be using while trying to take care of this so there are plenty of complications which can be associated with this which i already shared with you was coronary disease stroke heart failure the peripheral artery disease in fact hypertension is directly responsible for almost 60% of the stroke deaths and nearly one fourth of the coronary heart disease in fact so what is happening is the uh, the way in which this disease has been coming up has been changing especially like till the 2000 it most of the times the complications were acute events like the ischemic heart disease stroke or even premature death however in the coming uh, recent years what has been happening is the chronic disease is coming more relevant or more prominent like the heart failure in terms of systolic or uh, diastolic heart failure the chronic kidney disease dementia or even the atrial fibrillation as well so there are several studies as well which try to see so what are the possible strategies trying to control the systolic uh a hy- hypertension so that is what is was called the sprint trial otherwise then there were other uh trials as well trying to see whether intensive control is better or less intensive control is better so this is the design versus the hope 3 versus the sprint trial 
So, so this is one of the reasons. So what was happening is there were, has already been a lot of trials which has been coming up. For example, how to treat or take care of uh, the prevention, detection, in evaluation and management of the high blood pressure, especially in the adults. So that is how these guidelines has been coming up in fact. So what is hypertension? I think you all are already aware hyper means which is higher than the normal. So that's why it is described or defined into various stages for example like the normal, elevated, then comes the stage 1 and stage 2 in fact. So the normal one in which the systolic blood pressure is less than 120 and the diastolic is less than 80 in fact. And the elevated one in which the systolic blood pressure is 120 to 129 and the diastolic is less than 80. Similarly, the hypertension is defined into two stages, stage 1, stage 2. Stage 1 in which 130 to 139 is there or the diastolic is 80 to 89. Similarly, in stage 2, the systolic blood pressure is more than 140 is the systolic and the diastolic is more than 90 or equal to 90 in fact. So, in the newer guidelines which has come up, it has eliminated a term which is called as pre-hypertension. So, pre-hypertension, there is no stage at all. So, in fact, earlier which was 140 now it has been set as 130 so 130 is the new 140 in fact so as i already said it in fact the there's an integration of two concepts the home or the ambulatory blood pressure monitoring as well so for example uh, earlier which was only clinical setting or meeting one or more of the criteria which was already said it so what happens is, if there is a 24-hour mean of more than 125 by 75 or above, otherwise when someone is awake, then if the blood pressure is more than 130-80, otherwise if someone is asleep and if it is more than 110 by 65 in fact. So one of the most common ones, for example, because most of the times whatever recordings we all take is mostly during the daytime and the person is awake. So that is why. The most useful of these definitions is more than 130 by 80 in fact. So that is why now the newer definition of hypertension has become lower. And what is going to happen is more and more people will be classified as having hypertension. So of course uh, lifestyle, therapeutic lifestyle changes should be always the prescribed one uh, for the most of the people. So this slide tends to clearly show how much is the percentage of American adults with systolic pressure of more than 130 to 139 millimeter mercury or for diastolic 80 to 89 mercury in fact. So what happens is currently if you talk only about the Indian adults almost more than 40% of those people are going to be hypertensive in fact. And it has already been shown more and multiple and multiple times like if you try to see for the cardiovascular mortality it tends to double with each 20 by 10 millimeters of mercury blood pressure increase. So as you can see clearly in this graph right. So then if, and, and what happens is similarly if you try to be taking good care of the blood pressure the benefits are also immense. Immense so much so that. So for example, if you'll just reduce the 2 millimeters of systolic blood pressure, the stroke risk tends to come down by almost 6%. 6%. Even for the coronary heart disease, it's almost 4%. And then if you just increase it by further 1, so which will be 3 millimeters of mercury, then the stroke risk tends to come down by 8%. And the coronary heart disease risk tends to come down by 5%. So this is something really uh, very important thing what tends to happen. So that's why we also need to be a little bit more. You will try to compare the various guidelines which is already available. So these are some of the guidelines which is available. The ACC 2017 guidelines. Then comes the GNC 7 and otherwise also the GNC 8 panel report guidelines as well. So if we will try to see carefully what happens is the GNC 8 panel a member report tends to say you have to be 
slightly lenient, for example, for the diabetes. So they, on the CKD patients, up to 140, they accept it, okay? For, and they, for example, if there's an elderly gentleman as well, without having the risk factors of diabetes or CKD, they have also limited those patients that, okay, more than 150 is not at all acceptable for these kind of patients. So, when you will try to see, we all are aware of the ABCD. These are the drugs which we are using it for the, as antihypertensives. ACE inhibitors, the problem is, it can be difficult to use them for the COPD, otherwise it'll tell the people as well because of the incidence of cough or even the angedema as well. Similarly, the beta blockers, they are pretty good combinations, however, but the beta blockers can, uh, uh, you know, what will be happening is they may cause the impaired glucose and lipid metabolism. So that is why you have to be slightly careful. Similarly, the calcium channel blockers may not be tolerated due to the high incidence of the ankle edema. However, diuretics, okay, they may be, sound pretty good, but one has to be really careful if there's a diabetic hypertensive patient and because you are predisposing them for the risk of impaired glucose metabolism and also gout. So that is where the role of angiotensin receptor blockers come. So for example, like the azelsartans. It is, seems to be really good antihypertensive because all of the three parameters on which any hypertensive role is dependent. Efficacy, what happens is because it tends to have a pretty good longer dose. So, for example, when we try to see compared to the approved similar dosage of the other ARBs like the Olmisartan, Valsartan or Cadnisartan as well, the 24-hour ambulatory systolic blood pressure is much more effectively controlled. Similarly, regarding the potency, it is also more potent when you try to compare it with the other ARBs. Similarly, even for the safety, so when you are trying to talk about the withdrawal side effects, okay, so this, this drug seems to be much similar. So as I already said it, in fact, uh, what are the special things? So if we are talking about the azelsartan or as a molecule as well, so what are the special things about this? So the special thing about it is not only it has a special oxo oxidiazole ring, which is responsible for its lot of chemical action like the less acidic and more lipophilic. For example, uh, if we try to compare it with the candesartan, it also has better antihypertensive effect as well. And also the potency of azelsartan seems to be really good. And this is the reason due to its chemical structure, it also leads to very tight binding to the angiotensin 1 receptors, in fact. And this is the reason which tends to uh, cause better blockage of the angiotensin 1 receptor and also leading to the blood pressure lowering, in fact. So what are the... Uh, other things with a, another anti hypertensive which is called as chlorothalidone. Chlorothalidone, I think you are very much aware that it has a longer duration of action and also a longer half-life than hydrochlorothiazide. And chlorothalidone may be more potent than the hydrochlorothiazide in lowering blood pressure. But it may also be associated with more metabolic adverse effects such as hypokalemia. And no study has conclusively shown either drug to be better in preventing adverse clinical outcomes. And these differences should be considered when making choices about thiazide diuretic therapy for the hypertension. So if we try to see clearly over here, the hydrochlorothiazide versus chlorothalidone, so we can see uh, over here, for example, what happens is there's longer duration of action of the chlorothalidones. Similarly, although the metabolism is more through the hepatic and also it takes a little longer time for the elimination in fact as well and mostly gets excreted through the urine. So, chlorothalidone, almost 12.5 mg is roughly equivalent to 25 mg of hydrochlorothiazide. So, why do you think of combining uh, those two drugs? So, what happens is it has already been shown in the 
guidelines as well rather than trying to use the highest dosage of a single drug you should try to combine two agents so what happens is we are already aware blood pressure is equal is equal to cardiac output into the total peripheral resistance so cardiac output is further determined by the heart rate and the stroke volume similarly total peripheral resistance is indirectly a measure of the arterial pressure and the venous pressure and we all are very much aware beta blocker tends to affect the heart rate right similarly the diuretics are the ones which tends to directly affect the stroke volume however ARBs are the ones which tend to affect not only the arterial pressure but also the venous pressure as well okay so for example same way uh, calcium channel blockers tend to affect only the arterial pressure so this is the good thing about the ARBs so it is different but also complementary mechanism of action when you're trying to compare combine the ARB with the diuretics in fact so there are similarly a lot of studies as well uh, which has already shown for example if there's a high or very high risk patient if you're thinking of immediately starting up uh, therapy you should consider combination therapies and whenever uh, you're trying to give a combination therapy as well you should be able to see for the multiple mechanism of action as well about those individual molecules which are being used so if there's a young uh, person who is coming to you as I already said it first of all you should recommend the lifestyle modification and if still someone is not at the goal and the blood pressure is more than uh, like uh, there's a difference of at least 20 by 10 millimeters of mercury for then initially uh, yeah the difference is much lesser than monotherapy can be given however the difference is quite a lot more that is where you should try to think of giving a combination therapy and if with this if you are able to achieve the target blood pressure then you should continue with the same therapy and if not maybe that is the time you should try to think of combining an additional molecule as well so the last year already uh, during the European Society of Hypertension meeting there were several recommendations which was being given so they also tried to classify on different parameters like using the optimal normal high normal grade 1 2 3 hypertension and also the isolated systolic hypertension so then what happened is uh, they say it uh, so they are European guidelines are more lenient compared to the American ones so they said it like up to 140-90 is fine okay however uh, in most of the patients we will prefer to be having less than 130 by 80 and for older age patients they said it, okay let's try to be a little bit lenient 130 but to 140 is acceptable for us so uh, when we try to look at the recommendations which was made by the body so they said it combination treatment is recommended for most hypertensive patients as initial therapy so which of course includes uh, either ACE inhibitor or the ARBs as well or you may also include a diuretic or a calcium channel blocker and the, it has already been said as well preferably in the form of a single pill so it is easy to give uh, multiple pills but the compliance rate tends to be not so good in fact so that is why if uh, you're trying to give already a, a patient like two drug combination and still you're not able to get good results then you can of course combine the third drug so for example the do uh, the three drug combination can be in the form of a ARB or like the RAS blocker, calcium channel blocker, and add a thiazide or thiazide-like diuretic. Still, if you're not able to achieve a good control, then you can add a uh, more standard diuretic, more standard diuretic like the spironolactone, or maybe also an alpha blocker or beta blocker can also be added. And beta blocker should be considered at any stage, okay? and uh, yes uh, you should also try to see what are the other risk factors as well if someone is having a coronary heart disease or atrial fibrillation 
then you may consider beta blockers as well. So what about this? What is this unique combination actually? So what happens is, uh, especially for this molecule, if you are trying to give, uh, you should try to think for giving a dosage of 42 or 80 milligram once daily. And then after giving the azelsartan, what happens is it goes into the stomach where it gets hydrolyzed into its active uh, metabolite. And the bioavailability of the azelsartan is nearly 60%. And it doesn't get affected at all with food. So what happens is, if you give it before food or after food, it doesn't make much of a difference. And the elimination tea half is almost 11 hours. And what happens is, um, even if you give it alone or with chlorothalidone as well, it doesn't get affected much. And the good part with this is, if you have given it... Uh, uh, you know, uh, for example, for azelsartan, it takes like, you know, up to three hours. However, the chlorothalidone part will give a peak level in one hour immediately it's, it itself, in fact. So as I had already said it, um, this combination therapy should be preferred for someone whose good blood pressure control is not at all there. And then... There are multiple clinical trials as well which support uh, this combination therapy as well. For example, this study which came up in the Journal of Clinical Hypertension which already concluded that if someone is in stage 2 hypertension then the tr uh, combination of azyl azylsartan with chlorothalidone results in substantially greater systolic blood pressure reduction so which we can again see uh, in this graph gratefully in fact. And this was another important study when they tried to see or uh, compare azelsartan versus olmesartan as well. They saw that there were superior antihypertensive efficacy of azelsartan for the fixed dose combinations compared with the maximum approved dose of olmesartan. You raised a good question about the amlodipine. So what happens is it is a good molecule. But you, if you will see uh, carefully, it, it does have its own side effects as well. Own side effects, for example, it can also cause... What is the most common side effect with amlodipine? Can anyone recall? Don't know, sir. Okay, so what is... The, okay, so the most common side effect with amlodipine is pedal edema. So pedal edema is one of the most common side effects and when you will try to also see, as I said it, we are giving an antihypertensive not just for the control of hypertension, but also you are trying to reduce the risk of complications. You are trying to give cardiovascular benefits as well, mortality or morbidity benefits as well. And there is not much of renal protection or cardiac protection with the amlodipine. Do you understand? So that is also important in fact important factor okay so this was another uh, study as well in which uh, when they try to see for example for essential hypertension patients they try to see azelsartan and uh, and they could see the adverse effects were very less in fact the outcomes were really really good and in fact it led to the conclusion that azelsartan is well tolerated for patients over long term and also tends to give stable blood pressure improvement when you are using it in a treat to target blood pressure approach with the thiazide whenever you are trying to combine them with the thiuretic uh, thiazide as well. So, uh, when, whenever we are talk, trying to talk about all these things in a, uh, on a topic wise, so one of the common things is, so what about the guidelines? So, uh, how important are they? So, that is where, if you are trying to see about it is, so guidelines, as I already said it, it has been changing. It has been changing quite a lot. In fact, the latest guidelines as well, the American College of Cardiology or the American Heart Association guidelines has also changed the parameters for the definition of the hypertension. And they have already said it. In fact, 
the ideally the blood pressure it should be less than uh, 130 by 80 so if someone is having more than 130 by 80 definitely it is a hypertension in fact however when we will try to see the European counterparts, European people are a little bit more lenient, I would say. So they say even up to 140 by 90 is pretty much fine. However, um, there can be a little bit flexibility as well. That's what they say. So European guidelines are slightly more lenient while trying to compare it with the American guidelines. So what happens is, it does happen a lot of times. ARBs are pretty safe, pretty good. There's good uh, cardiovascular benefits are there. There is renoprotective action as well. So, for example, if there is a diabetic patient as well, then same way, even nephropathy or the the eye complications as well, the microvascular complications can be slightly lesser when you are trying to use ARBs. However, a lot of times you may want to even more potent more superior or a more efficacious arb and that is the time where the uh, molecules like the azelsartan tends to come and that was one of the rationale as well which led to the discovery of a newer molecule like the azelsartan and uh, this is again uh, this drug has been approved by the fda food and drugs Administration Bureau of the United States for the usage for the hypertension and it does have a good reduction without compromising in the treatment and also taking good control of the comorbid conditions of the hypertensive patients and if you try to have a better control in terms of the numbers so that is when you have to think for a dual therapy so rather than a moro therapy. So for example, azelsartan can be combined with chlorothalidone and they te tend to be better alternative when you are trying to see versus a monotherapy. And it has already been shown that it may show even better results when you are trying to com or compare it with the olmisartan or the hydrochlorothiazide combination as well. So thank you so much for your kind attention. I'll be happy to answer any of your questions. Are there any questions so far?